Everyone ready? Hi, I'm Maureen Stancic Boyce, class of 1993, 25th reunion. Um, and I am pleased to uh, welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Anjali Sastri. Uh, she is a senior lecturer in systems dynamics. Uh, in the classroom and in the field, Anjali applies systems dynamics thinking, action, research, uh, research and business model analysis to complex social challenges focusing on the entire enterprise. Since joining the MIT faculty in 2001, she has worked on close to 100 innovation projects, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And she continues to explore new ways to collaborate with students, with startups, and with managers and fellow educators. Her practical insights from all this work are distilled in the new book, um, Fail Better, Design Smart Mistakes to Succeed Sooner. So Angelina joined us today to share insights that she and her co-author, Kara Penn, who's an MBA from 2007, have gleaned from their own research. How, to, how smart leaders and entrepreneurs can design their innovation projects with a key idea in mind, ensuring that they optimize their learning from every failure. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Anjali Sastry. Thank you, everybody. I am thrilled to be here, and I recognize some faces in the room, so I'm really, really excited to have yet another chance to create a dialogue um, with those of you I already know and those of you I have not yet met. Um, I'm an MIT lifer. My undergrad degrees in physics and Russian and my PhD in system dynamics are all from MIT. Um, I can can never escape. Uh, and one thing that I think is amazing about MIT that draws me back uh, again and again is the ability to combine real world difficult stuff with rigor and thinking and analysis and math and modeling. And I'm going to show you a little bit of what I learned by taking this journey in the last 10 years or so. Um, so, as Emily already mentioned in her introduction, I have taken this whole idea of action learning to an extreme by creating dozens and dozens of on-the-ground projects. Um, and I really am interested in extremely challenging projects, places where a team might show up and not have electricity and yet have to deliver the full MIT toolkit. Um, places where our colleagues haven't had access to the kind of education that our students here get, but that nevertheless have amazing insights, knowledge, and skills to share with us. Um, and doing this made me realize um, that the projects that we work on with our students for classes have many things in common with projects that professionals undertake in their own work. So I started mining that kind of field of experience, seeing what I could take from what we learned from these extreme projects and working directly with students and partners in the field, how I could link that to what we were learning also about projects that take place in the workplace. So what I'm going to do today is array before you several ideas that have come out of these linked threads of my own work, and in doing so, invite you to add your thoughts, reflections, questions on this very topic. It's graduation season, so everybody's giving speeches about learning from failure. Um, and there's, and I actually spent a while, I was a bit obsessed, watching and reading like every graduation speech I could find. And the trouble is, they all have pretty good advice, right? You know, if you want to innovate, you're going to run the risk of failure. You know, you go, go get them. But one of the big problems is those speeches are given by people who, by definition, have emerged from failure <laughs> to declare victory, right? They're not in the thick of it. They're not struggling with it. They're not the people who didn't recover. So we have this huge sample bias, but also a kind of tendency to look at the way that J.K. Rowling or Steve Jobs or Oprah Winfrey or whoever tells, just to mention some of Harvard's speeches, speakers, uh, have tell, tell a story about failure that doesn't really map onto the methods and experience that we face when we're in the thick of it. And I feel like that mismatch can be a real source of 
almost pain, certainly discomfort for you as an individual. Because if you're struggling with things and then you hear these speeches about how you just got to power through it and figure things out and it's all going to be OK in the end, that mismatch is a very painful thing. Another painful thing I often discovered with my own students, some of whom might even have had this experience working with me, you in the room, um, and certainly with many companies I've worked with, is that very often people working through complex projects that take on big goals and amid many constraints um, realize that things aren't going to always work out the way they thought they would. So they've embarked on a project that may be very visible or maybe not so visible, but they sometimes switch into this mode of, I just got to get it done and turn something in. <laughs> right? Stu you remember those from your students' days? But they're all, this happens in companies all over the place. So I've been, after I, the book was released, I went around the world. I talked in Europe, in South America, in India, and could see in many companies employees really um, struggling with that experience of having embarked on a project that they knew before it even was all said and done wasn't going to deliver the way that people said or thought it was going to deliver. I became really interested with that challenge. Like, how do we, we have to embark on ambitious projects whenever we want to innovate, but we don't always get there. How do you tackle that mismatch? And it seemed to me that we had to add a lot of nuance to the notion of learning from failure. So I'm going to lay out a bit of that for you next. To guide my thinking, I found myself turning to, do you guys, do you guys ever read uh, Chris Argers' uh, paper? Some of you probably did, called Teaching Smart People How to Learn. It's a pretty good paper, a few decades old. Argers had worked with Don Schoen, um, and they'd done a lot of really interesting work together. Don was a, a dust professor here at MIT. <laughs> And Schoen's thinking has very much influenced me. You can trace its origins to Dewey and, uh, and other great American um, educators, and even all the way back to the Greeks. But Don really laid out that for professionals, there's two kinds of thinking that we do. We do the kind of automatic thinking in the moment that lets us get stuff done. This is the stuff of expertise tacit knowledge, kind of rules of thumb, thinking on your feet. And he calls that reflecting in action, in the moment being able to kind of map a situation you see or a problem you see or a moment that you're experiencing onto your own past experience and to draw on your past experience and your training and your education to figure out what to do. But he argues that professionals get better and the world gets better when we also reflect on our action after the fact. So this is sitting maybe on your own or maybe with your team after an experience. And it doesn't have to be at the end of a big project. It could simply be after a busy day of meetings, but trying to figure out what do we learn from the action we just undertook. Reflecting on action to pull out new insights and come up with new ideas. So he treats this in a very kind of general way. I kept wondering, is there a way to systematize this to make it simpler and easier? And what can we learn from professional practice? So those of you in the software world probably know about retrospect meetings. You certainly know how Agile and other methodologies build some of this, kind of getting stuff done and then figuring out what works into it. Those of you who come from the product development world, of course, are very familiar with prototyping and iterating, kind of trying something and figuring out what works. Um, so we see this in various professional practices. But uh, what are the linkages to what else we know about how people work? And how could these, these ideas be generalized even more? That's where we, we'll go next. So three questions that I'm going to explore with you. One is, a question, and I really want you to think about it for you personally, but also for your organizations and enterprises. How do you learn from failure? Then I want to say, um, to have us thinking at least for a few minutes about looking ahead. How can you orchestrate the right kinds of failure? And then perhaps the most overlooked piece, um, which is to look at how do you respond to what you learn along the way when you're midstream. And you'll see I've borrowed ideas from a variety of different disciplines to get us going here. But here is our first point to ponder. I'd actually like you to take a moment to think about this. Imagine your own staff, your colleagues, or your leaders 
outside of the workplace, maybe you're having a beer or a cup of tea or something, and you've got them in a rare, honest moment, if you ask them, how well do we learn from our own failures, what would they say? What would be their answer? <coughs> So spend a moment, maybe even jot a word down, and then I'd love to hear any thoughts any of you want to share. What, if you had to put words in their mouths, what would be the phrase that would bubble up? What would they say? How well do we learn from failure? I'm going to ask for a volunteer in a moment. We what? They'll say, do we even have a failure? We don't have them, right? Yes. And you know, especially I have a, a workshop I've been teaching multiple times in the last few years. And especially in other settings outside of the US, it is incredibly hard for top management teams to answer that question. Um, I have a version of the exercise I'll show you in a moment. Oh, I should have turned off my WhatsApp notifications. <laughs> That's a failure. Um, <laughs> but it's very common. Just the ability to call something a failure and to, to talk about it is very limited in many settings. Other answers to that question, yeah? So along the same lines, I think we would say that we don't call it soon enough. So we hang out the next day so we're pretty sure that it's not gonna go and sort of just keep right. going. Right. Um, so I think that's, for yeah. my organization, is an area that I have to do it faster. Yeah. So why do you think that happens? Um, I think because in our culture, we haven't created, um, our culture doesn't accept readily failure. You're, okay. you're always rewarded on the yeah. success yeah. and on the, on the checking the box of having done it well. And yeah. I don't think there, I mean, I think we're not alone in that. Yeah. Um, so I think when you fail, you're looked on as personally as a failure as opposed by saying, look, we thought this was gonna go a certain way, it didn't, let's cut the cord and move yes. on. We're not incented that way. Yeah, great. Yeah. Part of the core life and then to blame others. Yeah. So either you don't call it because you all want to, who doesn't want to succeed? Of course, we all want to be winners. We all want to succeed. And if there's any leeway, given, you know, the world might change and we might find something new or maybe miracle will happen, so let's not call it yet, because you know we still technically have another month till we have to make that report, so that's one of them. And another is to say those dumb, whoever it is, clients, customers, managers, who gave us, you know, you might, above my pay grade, people might say, right? We've had this, it looks like it's a failure, but hey, that's not really my job, or else to say that's, I really think, somebody else who has, is making this difficult for me or not making our project work out, somebody else's fault. What else would, what else would, ha would you hear? Yeah, Samuel. I think I'm in investment management and the, so obviously the hit rate can be really low. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. So the, but there's a sample bias. We do lesson learn, right. but it tend to be people that have overcome failure. Right. Otherwise, we would have been fired. Right. That. <laughs> right, right. So there's this huge selection effect, and this is very. This happens a lot in investments and VCs, right? So many people, VC experts and insiders, will say the first few deals, it's just luck. <laughs> and then you survive long enough until you maybe begin to suss out and figure out a few things, and then you have the luxury of being able to do the postmortem or do the analysis or even use that language and until you have that luxury. But think of the penalty this is imposing on our companies and on our society and on us as individuals that we don't have, the, we're not using all of our um, knowledge and all of our skills to pull out the lessons of a failure. If most of them are being swept under the rug or reframed, what are we walking away from in terms of insights? I think there's a huge challenge here. I have a 20 minute exercise that we don't have time to do now, but I thought I'd show it to you because I think it's pretty interesting. I asked people to think about their own professional experience and actually pull out a, a specific story, a specific experience of failure. And I actually didn't use the word failure, by the way. I said, where things did not turn out as anticipated. So what did you think at the outset? What happened at the end? Make a quick timeline. Know the kind of arc of the story. 
and then sit down with a colleague and figure out in conversation with them how did we address the gap between what we expected and what we saw? What was our method for doing that? And what did we take away? Very often, this how question is very poorly explained in organizations. Now, it is for organizations where there's a very, a very strong need for high reliability. So if you're in the safety organization in an engineering firm, for instance, or if you are on a transplant team in a hospital, you are well versed in these kind of methods of going back and pulling out what worked, what didn't, what went wrong. But in many other organizations, the how is very, very unclear. One reason is that some of our experiences don't lend themselves as easily to this kind of, of analysis. So with a surgical transplant team, it's very episodic. You, and you know the, at least at one level, you know the outcome pretty quickly, at, that whether at least you could, the, the patient survived that part of the, the surgery. So you know, you have a kind of very quick potential for a learning loop. In other cases, it's much harder. The other question is about what did you take away? What did you learn that's useful to the rest of your organization? Again and again, I see in firms, people may have learned a lesson and it spreads as a, um, a kind of rumor or a cover story, but the nitty gritty, the details, the really usable information is too often not shared. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But now I'm gonna spend a few minutes looking at why this is so hard, and we've already heard some of your comments that speak to this. Human beings are wired to be flawed in retrospect. We are just, this is, it's not just, we're trying to make ourselves look good because we want to get ahead in the world. It's that we are wired this way. So first of all, our lived experience lacks the counterfactual. MIT profs love actual, you know, rigorous research. We always want a control group. We want to be able to test for statistical significance. In our lived life, we don't have controls. We just have often just one experience, this one project or this one effort. So we don't have the basis on which to compare it. So we're forming kind of imagined counterfactuals and telling the story of what we did against what we imagine might have happened otherwise. There's not a lot of rigor to that process, so it's very easy to come up with a flawed inference. And then it's inevitable that we're wired to make attributions that make us look not so bad. And often, to your point earlier, make other people look worse, right? You guys might even remember the fundamental attribution error. Do you remember that one? So the fundamental, these are all sort of well-proven, hardwired biases um, and cognitive effects. But the fundamental attribution error uh, is the, F, the effect by which I, if I do well, it's because I'm great. And if I do poorly, it's because, you know, my computer crashed or somebody didn't give me the data and it's flipped for other people. So Kent, when you do well, it's because you are lucky, um, right? <laughs> and when you do badly, it's because, well, that's Kent, right? So we, we, we just naturally do this. So knowing that that happens is really helpful. In fact, if you guys like details, I found this amazing Wikipedia page each one of these little lines is a bias, and underneath it is the actual research backing it up. So this is called the Cognitive Bias Codex. So it's like the master list, uh, according to the people who put this together, of different cognitive biases that, that kind of give you a view as to um, how you process information, what information you pay attention to, how you tell the story about it. So this helps you really understand the many impinging factors that kind of affect how we make sense of the complex world we live in. So we could find even more of these biases, but knowing that they exist, knowing that retrospect is flawed, either because of cognition or because of real limits in data, mean that learning from experience is really difficult. Then we have this question about, even if you figured out an insight from failure, it's hard to talk about it. Um, so we've, we've already heard one um, thought in here about why we don't want to be seen as failures. Any other comments, reflections, thoughts on why talking about failure is so difficult? 
Yeah. If you haven't, if you haven't fundamentally resolved why and right. the solution for it, you really want to talk. About exactly. It. It's so messy. And again, because we often have this just this one-off experience, we don't even know for sure if our attributions or analysis is correct. And if you're being rigorous, you might want to hold off on telling a story because you actually don't know for sure. So one explanation could be X, another explanation could be Y, a third explanation could be Z. I don't actually know which is true. And by the way, this is a failure, so I'm not going to put more effort into it. So I can't tell you the good kind of analysis of this. So we don't know exactly what went on. That's a, that's a great insight. Other reasons, yeah. I think there is a, an inherent fear of talking about failure will bring more failure or yeah. disaster will happen and people yeah. don't like to talk about it. Yeah. So there's the superstition kind of feeling. Um, and then there's also the labeling. And there's a huge amount of really interesting research on this front. I don't know if you guys remember learning about um, uh, sunk cost thinking and other escalation of commitment mechanisms. But we're very wired, again, this goes back to kind of the kind of cognitive and social psychological underpinnings. We're very wired to see, once we get affiliated with something, we begin to see ourselves in that thing, right? We identify. We don't want to be identified with failure. We want to be winners. We also see, you were talking about investments. I actually started this work by looking at firms where there's a high fraction of failed projects, consumer product companies, um, in finance, in, in venture funding, but also in the pharmaceutical industry. So big pharma, of course, puts a lot of effort and money into uh, developing new drugs, the majority of which will not work, right? Everybody knows this ex ante. People who are doing the research are PhD scientists trained in the scientific method. And yet, if you talk to managers and leaders at pharma firms, they'll say, that the team that has developed and worked on a molecule often keeps finding reasons to continue the work on it, even when, to your point, the data has come back showing this is not a promising course of action. Right? So these firms are constantly trying to think of ways to create more rigor and put in more thresholds and kind of hurdles so that teams don't keep going down the same path. But we often, in fact, there's Carl Weick, a famous organization scholar, um, often says, how do I know uh, what I think till I hear what I say? So what you say and what you do becomes the thing that you see yourself as. So it's very hard, once you throw yourself into a project, to then say, hey, guys, we're actually on the wrong course. I think we should pull the plug and do something else, because your identity is wrapped up with that. There's also the social identity. Other people in the company say, you know, oh, she's the woman with that new you know, device. So what happens if that new device doesn't um, pan out? There, there's the social aspect of it that's very hard. And I'd argue there's another th thread in here, which is that we actually don't teach our kids, our students, our employees, how to talk about failure in a professional way. It's just not baked into the culture. And it's something that we're not born doing because we've seen all of those biases. So we actually have to teach that. Back there, you had a question or a point? Yeah, I was going to say that microphone. The, the, this place is biased, right? You can't get in if you're a failure. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're going, you're, the whole existence is to write your essays that demonstrate success so that the implied probability of success afterwards is equally higher. Yeah. And so you talk about cultures. But more importantly, the other thing I wanted to mention is, I think in a world where resources are stretched, budgets are compressing, returns mm -hmm. are compressing, there's more competition, it's just this, there's not room for failure as far as management is concerned. Yeah, but the challenge there is, if that then perpetuates the behavior you were talking about, then not, by definition, when you want to innovate, there's a risk of failure, right? So we're at the same time exhorting our employees and our colleagues to go for it, to innovate, to take bold risks, right? These two things are obviously incompatible. So how do you create a culture and a dialogue and more than that, systematic methods that allow you to say, hey, this is a risky project. We're going to launch into it. We're actually going to get some preliminary data and we're going to have a timeout meeting 
way before the end and decide whether it's worth keeping on going or whether we should pivot or whether we should pull the plug. Then you could recognize those pressures, but also try to speak to that innovation. Again and again, when I talk to companies, they see this, some of them see this as a risk issue, right? So they say, oh, well, we have risk registries. We have a whole process for mapping out risks. But often then, that, that's a kind of due diligence at the start of a project and then gets set aside. And then the project is launched and everyone's hell bent for the deliverables. Because we're on the hook for the deliverables, not for the conversation about updating our risk profiles. So how do you kind of blend those two? We had a point somewhere. Yeah, back in the back there. I think to some extent is a problem of culture and to some extent is a problem of corporate governance and incentives. Yep. You talk about pharmaceuticals yep. and it's Andrew Lowe is working on ways to address the yep. issue that on average a cancer drug has a 5% chance of success, costs yep. 200 million to develop in 10 years. Yep. And so if you are a researcher, what's your incentive of calling a failure earlier? Because yep. in any case, you're going to be associated with a failure and maybe yep. wait a few more years. Right. So to find a way to say, these guys, don't worry, you're just one of 20 projects, one of 50 exactly. projects, and if you fail, it's okay. And the second yeah. one is banking. In banking, if you make a loan and you're a, a, a branch manager, you have no incentive to declare that a loan has gone bust or is becoming problematic yeah. because then it goes on your P&L yeah. with the result that the bank right. does not work on the loan and by the time they do, it's too late. Yeah. <laughs> And often we see, especially for really big projects, big capital investments and other projects like that, so the person who made the decision has moved on, right? So the next one in that slot is the one holding the bag, right? That's the one who actually bears the, uh, the, the, the cost of that. Um, yeah, the reason I talk about pharma is that's a domain in which the key folks are trained in the scientific method. So at some level, they completely appreciate the value of falsification, of showing something doesn't work. And yet the human impulses are so strong to keep pushing for working on what you've already invested in. So I just think that really highlights that tension there. I think you're right. Part of the solution is to say, what's the value of disconfirmation? What's the value to the company and even to you as a professional showing something doesn't work? And by the way, there's a ton of research on learning that shows that when we encounter a failure, we think much more deeply than when we encounter a success. So if you want your company or your school or your family to be thoughtful, you actually want to have these failures as food for thought, as spurs for, it, for reflection, as the moment where you could actually get together and think about how do we do things better or in a different way. So then the big issue is how do you catch it early enough so that it's not a failure with a big F or all caps, it's a failure with a small F. And maybe we even need to give it a different name and not call it a failure. I just don't have a great word yet. Experience. You could call it experience. Yeah, lessons learned. The, Yes, pivots. So what, you're, so what you're talking about and what you were referring to about in terms of the culture of academics and schools um, is actually called the growth mindset. Yes. And what it, right. what it says is that when I encounter failure, how do yep. I respond? Yep. Do, I, do right. I have the inner yep. strength to take a step back yep. and evaluate it either as an yep. individual or within a group? Yep. Or do I yep. throw a temper tantrum? Great. And we see it in kids. Great. So this is a really powerful idea the growth mindset versus the performance mind or fixed mindset. But now I'm going to project uh, what my friend back there earlier said, right? Which is that we also have a system, even though we may give a lot of lip service to the growth mindset idea, we are rewarding kids, you know, and our, all of our students here for being successes, right? And our website tells the success stories of the students who do amazing things, the faculty do great. So yeah, there's always this, but I think that's an incredibly powerful um, idea. I think we need to go beyond mindset. I think we need systematic methods for having the dialogue. We need data. We need the ability to draw inferences and insights from emerging kind of messy data in the early stages of the project and the ability to say to our teammates, hey, we don't yet have you know, a statistical significance, or we haven't yet rolled out globally, or we haven't yet linked this module to the you know, customer module or whatever, but the way things are looking 
isn't quite panning out with what we thought was going to happen? Can we brainstorm some of the reasons there might be a mismatch? And I think reframing this kind of gap between what you expect and what you see as a moment for insight is really powerful. And in fact, if you look at most of our theories about how kids and adults learn, we actually learn when there's a mismatch between what we expected and what we see. That's why, and again, science works this way, that's why we write down hypotheses or make predictions, because that makes your ex-ante beliefs more salient and then allows you to juxtapose the experience against what you thought beforehand and find the mismatch. Finding that mismatch, if that could be the thing that fuels us, we would all be like learning machines. Um, and I think we tend to do it naturally. It's just not baked into how we organize ourselves and have dialogues within work teams and especially with our hires up. Let me put a few more ideas before you, so that, and I know we'll get more thoughts from the room too. I put a few of my thoughts here. You've already come up with many of them. The emotional valence of failure, the sort of feelings, the negative feelings about them. We have a huge value we place on persistence. This is fascinating research on why we really, and in fact, and it's also very culturally grounded. So especially in America, we really value the people who keep going on despite signals that things aren't working out, which is weird because you would think, you know, think of the flip-flop politician, for instance, you know, or somebody who changes strategy is often um, not, not really um, lauded, whereas we really should be valuing people who change their mind. I think we have, this is back to your point about the data, but how do you look at both data and the sort of systems thinking piece that could help you stitch together plausible causal explanations for a given experience? Another problem is they're all tarred with the same brush. So stupid failures, unethical failures, failures to um, treat people right or follow the law are thrown in the same bucket as the failures that were a molecule that no one could have ever known would or wouldn't work ex ante, right? Because we don't have a spectrum and a language for differentiating these failures, they're all in the same bucket. So that's a huge problem for us. Um, we talked a bit about, and those are some of the other things. We, yeah. So I want to talk a bit about how to solve some of those problems. First of all, we need, and actually this goes back, you were quoting Dweck on mindset. We know that another piece that's really important, so to cultivate a mindset that really appreciates growth and learning as opposed to pure performance and scoring well in the test or delivering a success. In addition to that mindset shift, we also need to cultivate psychological safety. And it's surprisingly, it's still controversial even at MIT. It's really interesting. Because I, I was talking to a colleague about this, and he said, well, we don't want to tell everybody that you know, everyone gets a prize or everything they do is OK. We need to be tough, right? So the two are not even on the same axis. We can be tough on thinking, but we don't have to be tough on people. This is what, something I think MIT is still working on. Like, how do you kind of separate being really critical about ideas or, or the data or the performance from being critical of the person. And psychological safety is about creating an environment in which it's OK to bring up difficult topics or to talk about failure or to admit that something didn't work um, or to say something that, uh, difficult, that might be difficult for others to hear without abusing the person or making them feel bad. So kindness. And other skills of bringing in people, listening to them, um, allowing kind of bad news to be spoken in a way that's a bit depersonalized and that allows us to kind of not take it all so personally would really, really help. There's a stream of emerging work on this, and I think it's a fascinating domain. But the other point, which I've already kind of hinted at earlier, is that we need systematic methods for learning from failure. So not just these sort of culture shifts, but they need to translate into actually doable practices and habits. Otherwise, it's all just talk. <laughs> and I would argue that pretty much everyone in the room has something they've figured out about this. And there are some organizations that have really invested a lot in this. I'll share a few of those ideas. And hopefully, that'll spur some more thoughts for, for you guys in your own work. 
So here are three, I'm going to look at three different phases of a given kind of project for, to give us a bit of a framework or anchor. So one is after you have failed, here are three ideas that might be useful for your thinking. So one, that sort of point we, we just touched on. Humans have to learn from all failures, but we cannot and must not treat all failures as sort of equal. Some failures need to be criticized, punished, called out. Others are simply things didn't work out as we had hypothesized they might work out. Yet we have to learn from all failures. So this is a huge challenge in the world. There needs to be systematic efforts to look back at both the kind of desirable and undesirable failures. And at the same time, going forward, we really need to try to entice people to work only on the smart failures and avoid the dumb failures. So let's take the example of a safety violation. You learn something. If somebody in your manufacturing plant does something wrong and commits a safety violation, the whole company needs to learn from it. We have methods for doing that in many companies. And we need to also make sure that it's called out as something unacceptable. So we both need to learn from it and say, guys, we don't want this to happen again. Whereas in other cases, you might be running an A-B test. One of those tests is by definition going to perform more poorly than the other. You'll learn from that test it wasn't an unacceptable failure. It was a test. So we have this challenge of separating the good failures from the bad failures and the need to have a language and also courage to talk about it. To be able to say, this was really something that we can't do again. This is something that we don't ever want to repeat versus this is something we learned a lot from. How can we keep doing stuff like this? That nuance between the different kinds of failures I think is incredibly important. So I've looked at different organizational structures for learning from experiences of failure. Um, and so I called some of these happenstance. So these are the failures you don't design for. They happen. For instance, medical errors, aircraft near misses. The FAA has a database of those. Uh, we have governmental commissions like the Challenger Commission that look back on these large failures. Here at a B school, we have lots of these, you know, very interesting, rich case studies, um, and then we have different practices. So these are different ways that organizations try to pull out an insight from a random or unplanned experience. And then, of course, we have designed, planned experiments, new type, uh, new product development, engineering test beds, simulation lean and other methods are all designed around that. So I think being able to even just differentiate the two modes of learning from experience at the collective level and say here we're trying to really learn from bad outcomes so that we avoid creating mistakes again. There we're trying to figure out how do we pressure test our key assumptions and find out new things about the world by doing smart tests and how do we harness serendipity. Okay, we don't need to belabor this. I've already made this point. But there's a good paper here that's useful. Amy Edmondson in HBR a few years ago. She just has a typology, a framework for talking about these different kinds of failures. And the framework by itself is in rocket science, but being able to use it to talk to your colleagues might be very useful. So can you then kind of use that framework as a method for sparking a dialogue about the different kinds of failure? Okay, idea number two. I've seen, and I don't know if you've seen this in your own work, but we certainly see this in domains as from politics to the military to elsewhere. Some people call it overlearning. So one failure mode of failure, learning from failure, is that you have some kind of negative experience and it's so painful that it becomes the story everyone in the organization tells each other and you're like, we are never going to do that again. And that can become, obviously, a very flawed route to take because you're missing great opportunities because you've written off a whole approach. My husband has his own company. 
He hired a marketing person. It didn't work out. And now he keeps telling me, oh, marketing doesn't work. I'm like, that's ridiculous, right? But he had this one experience that didn't play out the way he thought it should. And he's a small business owner. He's like, I don't have the luxury to try things again. So that's, of course, highly irritating to me. But I can totally, I can see how this happens then very quickly. You try something once, you get burned, and you sort of write off that whole approach. So overgeneralizing. And then the other is overlooking. So kind of setting up this um, exceptionalism. Yeah, it didn't work out that time when we went to Chile, but you know, Brazil is totally different, right? We won't repeat, it'll be, it'll be a whole new story. And often when you meet deep experts, they will be telling you very, they spend a lot of time telling you how their specific example is so different from anything else. You could not possibly carry over any lessons from one domain to the other. So try to avoid those two extremes of storytelling, where we try that, it doesn't work, never do that again, or every case is so unique and so special, and let me lecture you on all that's unique about this situation. How do you find that middle ground in talking about failure? Otherwise, you're gonna draw the wrong lessons from failure. You either won't use them or you'll overreact to them. So finding that balanced approach so you can kind of weigh the evidence on both sides. So here's a very specific method. Those of you who come from the military are quite familiar with it, I'm sure, but we've seen this in <coughs> other domains too, the after action review. And after action reviews can be really, really quick and dirty. I don't know if any of you have tried this rosebud thorn method, do you guys know it? So this is after a meeting or in any kind of routine situation, you just go around the room and you say, what's the rose? The beautiful thing we did or discovered, whether it was by design or accident, that we need to remember and do again, or maintain and cherish and nurture, right? Thorn, what should we really not do next time? <laughs> like, what did we waste our time on this time, or where did we misstep? Like, what's the thorn in what we just did? And bud, where's the promising new idea? What do we get some new inklings about that we could maybe build on or follow up on. We don't know for sure whether this is the way we should go or not, but what's the new idea that we want to follow up on? And we've seen this, I've looked at a huge variety of teams that use methods like this. So we see it in the military, but I also saw it in wildland firefighters. So these are those teams of firefighters that get parachuted into wildfires. Um, and in teams like that where there are these they have to re respond very rapidly on the ground, but also hand off to the next shift. There's huge value in extracting immediate insights, right? So they've, there's, a, there's some fascinating research on this. They've taken these after action review methods and used them as tools for debriefing at the end of a 12 hour you know, firefighting shift, figuring out what's working, what's not, what to change, what the insights are, handing off to the next team. Why don't we do this all the time? Why don't we have in our standing meetings an ability to say what's working, what isn't, what are we gonna hand off, uh, what are we gonna um, drop? I have a lot of detailed guidance, I can give it to you later, um, but I found great write-ups, including the, everything from the, you know, Army's uh, manuals to, um, some, my book also um, describes some of these methods, um, and there's an HBR article called Learning in the Thick of It. So those will give you some useful um, ideas for doing after action reviews. Okay. All right, so that's, that's another practice that might be really helpful as a systematic method for learning from failure. And maybe the thing it can do is give your team a little bit of practice in talking about what's working and what isn't so that it becomes more professionalized, more easy to do, and um, becomes a kind of engine for you guys to learn from your own experience. Any thoughts on this, these general ideas of how you learn from past experience? Have you tried methods like this? What works, what doesn't? Antonio. Yeah, yeah I'm a little bit struggling a little bit with the, this concept of the, the balance between kind of perseverance yeah, so I'm struggling a little bit with yep. the uh, balance between perseverance and actually knowing when to quit. Yeah. Because, you know, if you've done that like a lot of times in your life and yeah. things actually work out, but then suddenly they don't, yeah. you're like, oh, what's going on? <clears throat> so it's really hard to learn to know how to, how to quit. And sometimes, sometimes you're like, okay, so maybe I quit, but then maybe I try another way. Yeah. Um, but, you know, yeah. So this is, 
part of this is just the human condition, right? <laughs> we, we have to live our lives without having perfect information and make decisions. So this is existential to all of us. We all have this issue we have to wrestle with as we go. How, when do you walk away? When do you keep going? Um, just know that the stories that are told are by definition very biased. You hear about the person who, you know, tried pitching their company to, you know, 211 <coughs> funders and the 210th gave her the funding, right? And that's the success story. But there's some other, you know, person who did the same thing and didn't get the funding and we never hear from them. So know that the stories are biased, that's one. But then the other is, what's the team and individual capability you need to cultivate to have a wiser decision about quitting or not, or pivoting? I really think that there's huge scope for using <coughs> systems thinking, so I'm trained in system dynamics, so I keep seeing a massive potential here for teams to use systems thinking as a way to map out their causal hypotheses, maybe do it before you even launch a project, but then keep returning to it to say, hey, we thought these were the three important factors, and we thought that if we did this, it would lead to this, which would then cause this to happen. Is that holding true? Like, use your explicit kind of theories as a guide for your whole team to weigh in on. And maybe then you'll hear, especially if you can represent it on a diagram, or some very simple <coughs> one pager, you then have an ability to come back to it as a team. Everyone can look at it and reflect on it and add their piece of data. And what we found, especially by using causal loop diagramming, is if it's a nice sort of clean, simple, but not too simplified diagram, everyone on the team <coughs> understands it. As they have their experiences, they can actually start to argue for, oh, I think we need to add another loop. Or, oh, I think the reason we're seeing mixed results here is that there's actually two different factors playing out. Let me tell you what I think they look like. So can you create an artifact, some kind of representation that then captures the growing complexity that you're discovering and use that? Another point is that not everything should be done by experimentation. It may be that you need to do some analysis, look at your early results, and actually bring in data scientists to look for patterns that you can't see in the way you're looking at it now. Maybe you should be looking at analogies or parallels more systematically to kind of extract potential use cases or potential stories. So your lived experience only gives you this sort of slice of reality, but what are the other tools you can use? Using your team, using the dialogue, using the kind of mapping process is one and then using the data you've got in new and clever ways is another. And then the third is using analogies, history, examples more cleverly could give you another. But this is an inescapable challenge we all face. Do you know, you know, know when to hold them, know when to fold them? You have to figure out how you're gonna play that hand. I think being conscious of it and tracking what happens can be really valuable, because at least then you can even if you made the wrong call, at least you'll have learned that lesson, right? <laughs> Any other thoughts, reflections? Yeah. So, um, so this is at all at professional level, you know, in the companies and all that. But uh, my thought is that, or my question rather is, from childhood, you know, we are, we, our our system, our thinking is built up in in particular way. You know, mental models yep. are built right from the childhood, and how we rea react react in the childhood, and that's kind of we yep. bring that, in, you know, yep. to the professional world. So at that, I mean, how, how, what are your thoughts? How would you change that thought process at yeah. that level? Because that's going to bring it when you yeah. go. So um, I read a book a few years ago. It's probably pretty old by now um, called, um, I think it was called The Scientist in the Crib. Have any of you guys read that? It's quite interesting. It's about how babies are natural experimenters. And they actually, so this is a bit controversial. Some people say it's too literal, but some people say, no, actually, babies do form their version of hypotheses. And they actually do experiments. And anyone with a toddler who's seen the you know, cereal bowl getting dropped knows they're quite good at running small scale experiments. So kids do have, actually, we do have some of these tendencies built into us as humans. So one big question is how do we 
parent and teach in a way that nurtures that capability, that mindset point, I think is invaluable to say, to, and we're finding this translate. So one is, we know that people fall on a spectrum. Some of them are very performance oriented. You might even think of your own, yourself or your family members. Some people are so focused on performance, they never want to try a new sport or whatever because they won't do well, <laughs> right? And then there are other people who are willing to try anything and just love trying new things and learning from them. The research shows you can actually cultivate movement along that spectrum, right? So it's not just that you're born, you're wired with one mindset or another, you can actually cultivate it. So can we teach and coach and design our lives and our kids' environments that allow them to go for a growth mindset? Um, I've also, I've, tr I've been trying, very, I, I actually assign readings on this topic to even my mid-career students because I think it's really important to understand those two mindsets. Back there, a question, and then we'll move. Well, you um, mentioned organizations and uh, stigma of uh, failure. Uh, it reminded me of the importance of, um, of listening, yeah. be able to listen and to be able to get people to ultimately open up and share yeah their experience, their knowledge, since yeah. otherwise you will not even get to the yeah. bottom of things. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So how do you create the space for the people around you to talk about this? I talked to, I mentioned the topic of kindness and psychological safety, mm -hmm. but before that even, you gotta shut up, <laughs> ask the questions and listen, right? So that's a huge, another piece of this is cultivating the ability to tell the story. and huge flaw with retrospective analysis of failure is that it seems so self-serving, right? So when you have after action reviews or you revisit a failure to kind of pull out its lessons and broadcast it in the company, and we've seen companies try to do failure newsletters, even failure annual reports, but one of the big problems is that it's just so easy to get cynical about this, right? You know, so-and-so messed up on their project, now they're writing a paper about, you know, their failure. Like, it's, it seems like that's not what we should be lauding in the company. So there's a huge challenge here. So here's my antidote to that. You have to plan for it. If you don't do it ahead of time, great storytelling after the fact runs up against its limits. So even the best ex post analysis of storytelling, if it's not actually presaged by an, a kind of plan and a theory of what you want to accomplish, it falls flat and it's limited in its ability to tell, to either deliver good insights or to be credible. And in fact, my guidance for this so I'm saying map out your causal story ahead of time. <coughs> Don't just say to your team, what's the deliverables? You know, we're working for the man. We'll just like get our stuff done, do what we're told to do, and you know, about my pay grade. But get the whole team to think about what are we doing and why? What's the change we're trying to create in the world? Can we put it into a diagram? Can we start talking about it systematically? That allows you to then lay out a theory ahead of time. Then when you encounter a failure, you have something against which to tell the story. You can say to your team and to your company, here's what we thought at the beginning. Here's what we wrote on day one. Here's where we are today. Look at the gap. Isn't that an amazing insight? <laughs> we thought the world was X. The world is Y. This is great. You can celebrate that if you have that anchor at the beginning. It's extremely hard to do without the anchor. And um, not to go all military again, but there's some amazing work from the military on using the leader's or commander's intent. This is serving as a sort of anchor for teams, where you can say, here's what we're trying to do in a really cogent and clear way that then gives you something against which to tell your story at the end. And I have, as always, I don't, we won't go through the details here, but I found great similarities with methods in manufacturing, such as um, Hoshin Kanri, like being able to link up what you're doing with bigger kind of goals for the organization and specific examples. All right, I know I'm out of time now. Um, I'll lead you with my last point, which is that, so figuring out how to tell, extract the lessons of failure, teeing it up, 
by having a kind of map and story about what you're trying to achieve that you're public about so that as things play out, you can report against it are two really important things. And the third you've already mentioned is being able to do a midstream pivot or two. How do you create those moments when even though all the data isn't in, it's still messy, it's still conditional, it's not fully representative. But if you feel like the signs are coming in that you had the wrong end of the stick or your, your plan wasn't complete or comprehensive or good enough, how do you then have that conversation? Good leaders, I think, create those moments for a deep dive or a reflection or a pivot point kind of meeting where you're stepping out of the fray of getting things done and you're asking, are we on the right track at all? Um, so create those moments within your teams. You can't wake up every day saying, what are we doing and why and why am I here? That's completely a waste. Uh, but you, if you never do it, you're also really missing a huge opportunity. So how do you create those midpoint correction moments? Okay, that's it. Um, so I'm hoping that we can continue this dialogue about how to avoid the really big failures, create the right small scale ones that teach us something, and create cultures, families, schools, organizations that value smart failure, that prevent dumb failure, and that help us all to learn from each other and our own experience. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>